Hi, it's Marty and Claire. We are presenting the first episode of Most Science Basic Classification Differences in Physiology. We will start by visiting ITIS website. We can see the kingdom of plants and the division of bryophyta and the direct children of it, the eight classes. And in this episode, we will talk about the most common classes, which are Sphagnopsida, Polytrichopsida, and Bryopsida. The rest will be covered in future videos after covering the basics. We will divide our mosses into more basic groups. Acrocarpus mosses and Fluorocarpus mosses. We will also cover the terms of endohydric and ectohydric moss. Acrocarpus mosses have their gametophyte producing sporophyte at the tip of a stem or the main branch. They grow in erect tufts, often forming cushion-like structures that are protecting the moss from loss of water through evaporation, for example during windy weather. The Pleurocarpus mosses have the gametophyte producing sporophyte borne on short, lateral branches. Not at the tips of the stem or branches, they form structures resembling carpets, with few exemptions like big shaggy moss, or springy turf that are growing more upwards like an acrocarp. Another distinctive difference is how moss is taking their nutrients. We can divide them into two groups, endohydric mosses and ectohydric mosses. Most mosses are ectohydric, which means they absorb their nutrients mostly externally from rain, dew, fog or dust. Process can occur thanks to capillary activity when liquid is moving against the forces of gravity through conductive material or tissue, how fast depends on the viscosity of the liquid. Endohydric mosses, taking their nutrients through substrate, like in vascular plants, thanks to specialized cells called hydroids and leptoids. The first one are responsible for the transport of water between cells and the second one is transporting sugars. However, it is happening to an extent. The most developed system is in class of polytrichopsidas. Mosses like common haircap, dawsonia, smoothcap moss. It also occurs in neums and briums to a lesser extent, and even in some pleurocarpus moss, like big shaggy. And now here is a table of the effectiveness of internal conduction in some mosses which shows basically what we had been talking over so far. Endohydric process takes up to 30 minutes, where ectohydric works almost instantly. Maybe that's why most of the mosses develop towards being ectohydric. The class of sphagnopsidas and its genus sphagnum we can classify to acrocarps and ectohydric mosses. Although they have morphological differences from other mosses, the class Sphagnopsida is distinguished by leaves that are one cell thick and mostly possessing two types of cells. Photosynthetic cells and hyaline cells. The hyaline cells are dead at maturity and are responsible for the extraordinary absorption of water, 20 to 30 times of the dry weight. Most of them thrive in acidic habitats with few rare exemptions. They love humidity, but be careful, sphagnums are known from waterlogging areas of their habitat to get rid of competition by drowning them. Dried sphagnum can be used as an addition to substrate. You can always cut the lower part of sphagnum up into little pieces and use it in your substrate mix. Another class that we will take a look at are polytrichopsidas. These are endohydric mosses. We can classify them along with acrocarps. They are using hydroids and leptoids to move water and sugar internally. Polytrichums and dawsonias are the best equipped from endohydric mosses. Polytrichum commune grows over 20 cm and dawsonias can reach even up to 70 cm in height. If you are planning to have a moss from the class of polytrichopsidas, you will need to take the substrate you are using under serious consideration as they rely on absorbing nutrients mostly from the soil. The most common and vast class, the Bryopsida, we can find the most notable mosses among this class. Around 84% of all moss families and over 90% of the species. It appears that the only unique trait of Bryopsida is its peculiar peristome, 
built out of arthrodontous teeth. Almost all are ectohydric with few endohydric mosses, like manumes, bryums, or at very low levels, big shaggy moss and springy turf. Now it's time for a short presentation of moss physiology. Photos from the moss guidebook, the link will be in the description. We will cover all the subjects more in extensively in future videos. Have a quick look. I'm sure you have seen this before, either in a book or somewhere on the internet. We hope that you can now understand mosses a little bit better. And a short recap from this episode, sphagnums like high humidity, acidic habitats, and thanks to their dead cells they can absorb large amounts of water. We can classify them as ectohydric acrocarps. Polytrehopsidas like high humidity, substrate that will log water and provide the moss with water and nutrients. They are mostly endohydric, they grow in tufts and have their arhegonias at the stem tip. We can classify them as endohydric acrocarps. The bryopsida is the largest class. The teeth on their peristome are their unique trait. Besides mumes, bryums, rest can be classified as ectohydric acrocarps or ectohydric pleurocarps. We will see you next Wednesday in episode 2. Take care! The references will be in the description.